Namaste and greetings. I, Sneha Bisht, researcher at INDRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, even Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, May Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all at INDRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a panel discussion on the topic Education and Union Budget. 2022-2023, as a part of the series, The State of Education, Hashtag Education Dialogue. This event is being organized by Indra Center for ICD for Development. Now let me take this moment to introduce the gathering. As the chair of today's session, we have with us Professor Sachidanam Sinha, Professor at the Center for the Study of Regional Development, Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, New Delhi. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to our esteemed panelists for today, we have with us Professor Mona Khare, who is a professor and head of the Department of Educational Finance at National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration, New Delhi. We are honored to have you, ma'am. Welcome to the session. We are delighted to have with us Dr. Toteva Kundu, who is the thematic lead of social sectors at the Center for Budget and Governance Accountability, New Delhi. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. We are fortunate to have Professor Swaman Chattopadhyay, Professor and Chairperson at Zafi Hussain Center for Educational Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU. New Delhi. Welcome to the session, sir. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Vice Suresh Reddy, Director at SRF Foundation, Gurgaon. We welcome you, sir. Namaste. Now I invite our chair, Professor Sachidanam Sinha, to initiate the discussion with this opening remarks and to proceed with this discussion. We look forward to learning from our esteemed panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Sneha. Thank you, Impri. Um, I think this is uh, the right time, you know, four days after the budget was presented, uh, to in fact, that we have been in a position to internalize some of it, look across as to what is happening on the ground in the area of education, and also with related aspects within the budget, because all of these are going to have an impact also on education, particularly on school education. Um, certainly higher education will also impact it in a certain way because there are some uh, remarkable shifts that one can perhaps witness. I think, you know, the panelists here would be in a position to throw sufficient light and help us understand the dynamics and uh, particularly after you know we had this two years of school closing down and universities closing down uh, uh, so you know the the challenges are too many and what uh, the new uh, the, the budget brings for us in 22-23 uh, I would request uh, the panelists, whosoever perhaps could also throw some light on how education budget has been behaving over the years, because that would also perhaps uh, tell us as to what is this 11.8 or 12% increase in the budgetary allocation for 22-23, in what way it's likely to shape up. I was listening to some of the people who understand budget and finance, you know, they say that Effectively, if you look into whatever increase that has been proposed here and there, of course, there are there are also areas where things have declined, or maybe there are uh, no allocations. Uh, may eventually work out to be close to about five to seven percent lower than what perhaps has been is being made out. Which I I was just checking up the statistics and it. 
uh, it became very clear to me that you know we have not perhaps you know the last year's uh, revised uh, estimates are much lower than what we did in 1819 uh, <clears throat> So, uh, without taking much of uh, the time between, uh, I think you know we should invite uh, the panelists. Uh, uh, they are the ones who perhaps have gone through the figures in a much more uh, systematic way, and I think the concern before us is to, in fact, look at those children, about two, 250 million children who, in fact, were affected adversely during the pandemic. You know, there is a lot to catch up. Um, that uh, and this will have to be made largely through this the initiative of the state and the government, the private sector, and uh, you know the ICT can only play a supplementary role. Uh, but there is much that needs to be uh, seen as to how it's going to transform the learning abilities and capabilities in the schools in their neighborhood. So. Over to, uh, I would rather invite uh, our first panelist, Dr. Pratibha Kundu from Center for Budget and um, Governance. I think you know she will make the initial remarks about the budget and perhaps take care of school education within the budget. So uh, Dr. Pratibha. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arjun and MP for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk in on this issue. Uh, I have a presentation. Let me share my screen. So, I mean, we have seen the last two years, uh, the it's, it's an, an, both the years are unusual and we have seen that how the COVID-19 and COVID-induced lockdown has exposed the uh, fault lines in public provisioning of uh, social services, delivery of social services and education is not an exception. Uh, uh, is my screen coming, uh, the full screen? Is this visible? Yes, it's fine. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so the whole the whole social, social sector was affected because of the uh, of this pandemic. And uh, if we look at this year's economic survey, then uh, we all know that uh, education is uh, in concurrent use. So both uh, Indian government and state both have the responsibility of financing. So let me first see in the, what is the scenario and so, social sector that economic survey has shown that uh, it, it is telling that uh, in the last two years, I mean, that means 2021 and 21, 22, that during the pandemic, there is increase in social social sector budget in terms of uh, total as percentage of total expenditure as percentage of GDP as well. And this is the public expenditure means both center and state together were putting money for social sector. And within this social sector, if we look at the distributions, where social sector means here we are talking about education, health, drinking water, sanitation, urban development, welfare of SCST, nutrition, et cetera. And within that, if we look at the pattern of uh, fund distribution, uh, from 2014, 15, 46% of the social sector expenditure was going for education. And if we look the trend, it's continuously decreasing. And this the, the recent year data available 21, 22, it's 36.6%. Again, here I'm talking about both center and state together. Now we all know that last two years, obviously health should get priority because of the situation, but it is not the case that in the last two years, education was not getting adequate resources, but the trend is, I mean, ongoing for, at now it's for last seven, eight years. So this was the background of the finances. Now this budget, when the government was presenting, we need to keep in mind the other things on which background this budget uh, was getting presented and uh, what we were expecting from the sector. Uh, so we just not talk about the age, uh, pandemic, but what was the status of school education before pandemic is important. Then during pandemic, because of the school closure, we have seen that how educational inequality has increased. So unequal cost of school closure is an important factor to keep in mind. 
and then after the when the the after this third wave of covid when the situation is getting improved little bit and when there is talk about reopening of schools then what role budget should be play, uh, should play uh, uh, in this scenario and finally when we have last year we got the national education policy 2020 so the rolling out of nep recommendations or impl uh, implementation of nep recommendations uh, what is there in the budget so these are the under these four things this four uh, backdrop the budget was presented so what we have uh, first let me just talk about little bit what was the situation before the pandemic so it gives us the uh, gives us a picture that that uh, what was the state of education uh, from the nss data we have seen 3.2 crore children were out of school around 40% adolescent girls who were out of school as per ncpcs survey enrollment in government school for the first time just it has come down to less than 50% not even the half of the enrollment uh, was in government school and there is increase in private unaided schools uh, i mean enrollment has increased in private unaided schools teacher share in government school decreased from 54% to 51% and whether uh, the last point is learning crisis both in public and private schools uh, if we refer as a survey if we refer as a national achievement survey everywhere we see this was this this was the scenario then when this pandemic started in march 2020 when uh, because of the safety measures government closed all the educational institutions uh, the various media reports survey reports shows a number of factors uh, a study by uh, locked out uh, the drays and other uh, some of the other researchers the report recently came they have they have shown that 8% only uh, in the rural area could attend online classes regularly and 37% were not at all studying, uh, I mean, not uh, attending any online classes. Then there is Azim Premji University study, which is saying that 92% students had lost at least one language ability. Uh, the, again, the recent ASA 2021 survey has shown that there is reverse school migration. Uh, now, enrollment in government school has increased, and between these last two years, it has increased from 66% to 70% within one year, 2021 to 21, 22. There are some other studies which are showing that what could be the possible impacts because of the uh, going education going to the virtual platform. Uh, so the a study by Malala Fund is showing, showing more than 10 million more secondary school age girls could be out of school, and they are at the risk of... Uh, early marriage, early pregnancy, et cetera. Then, then campaign against child labor, another, uh, they do survey on child labor and they have shown in different states like Tamil Nadu in the period of last year, uh, the child number of child incidents of child labor increased from 28% to 80% in West Bengal, 105%. There is a uh, increase in nutritional insecurity studies are showing. Uh, again, an Azim Premji study has shown that uh, around 83% urban and 73% rural household had consumed less food during this lockdown. Now, these are all the data from different media reports or surveys, but we don't have any pan India data. So to understand the extent of impact of COVID on children, who are school going but what we have understood from this scenario that it's not about only school school closure is not about only affecting learning it's it has a long lasting impact in terms of uh, nutrition in terms of mental health physical health so in this backdrop we got a budget now again we need to focus on reopening of educational institution that is going to happen now so for that, what we need a basic school infrastructure to implement the COVID safety protocols. We need to have a survey to identify the out of school children. We need to have human resources in place, capacity building for teachers because teachers are no more just like uh, edu um, uh, educators. They have to play the role of mentors or uh, they have to take care of the well-being of children's uh, mental health. So there is a need for curriculum remodeling, the learning deficit that has happened, there is need for remedial learning. And overall, if we don't know what would be the situation, so parallelly, if we go to, um, again, go for online education, or if we need to choose hybrid mode, then creation of digital infrastructure is also important. So in this backdrop, we got a budget of 1,44,277 crore. 
and that means and it which is basically from the uh, 21-22 B or earlier years budget estimate a 12% increase and the increase is both in the both of the departments department of school education and literacy and department of higher education now these are all uh, we are looking at the absolute numbers but if we if we uh, if we really uh, take the inflation in picture then the uh, it's basically an incremental budgeting but what does it these figures uh, show in terms of ratios if we look at the pattern of spending as per the ministry of education's budget as percentage of union budget for the last few years, I mean, in 2016-17, it was 3.6% of union budget was going for education, which has dropped down to 2.6%. And uh, uh, if we compare it in terms of as percentage of GDP, again, 0.47% of GDP to it has dropped down to 0.4% of GDP. That means we can see over time, the union share of uh, the union budget for education is actually decreasing. Why this is important, we have to uh, look at in terms, as I mentioned earlier, that since education is the role of uh, both the responsibility of center and state, that means if we need to, the vision of NEP or the Kothari Commission from long back, what we are talking about 6% of GDP, if we really need to reach that target, that means now the responsibility is more on states. But at the same time, we have seen the states have so much resource curve. The revenue mobilization of states have hampered a lot uh, during last two years. So uh, center and state together uh, is now spending 4.4% of GDP. That means we still have to uh, increase our budget to 1.6%. But within this 4.4% of GDP, basically 2.8% of GDP is going for school education. And in the whole share, how much is then coming from Ministry of Education, which is the nodal ministry, 0.25% of GDP of school education is basically uh, the union government's contribution towards uh, the uh, school education. So, uh, so that means the 4% the of GDP is coming actually from states. Now, this is the overall budget. If we now disaggregated the budget across the different, uh, and more another point to here mention that till November, if we look at the controller and auditor, uh, the CGA account, till November, the government has able to spend only 60%. The ministry has able to spend only 60% of budget. That means we are expecting in the coming four months, they will spend 40% of the budget and that is impossible. So also next year, we could see the expenditure would be much lesser than what they have even predicted in the revised estimate. So a disaggregated picture of across schemes. Uh, why it is important, the, the Samagra Shiksha Abhijan, this is the key centrally sponsored scheme of school education. Every sort of interventions are now coming under Samagra Shiksha Abhijan. We, 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 if we see that, yeah, there is 20% increase in the, uh, in the overall budget of in Samagra Shiksha Abhijan. But again if, again, if we compare that budget with the pre-COVID situation, that means the, uh, the allocation in the 20 21 uh, for Samagra Shiksha Abhijan was around 38,900 crore. But if when there is need for more resources, the Samagra Shiksha is getting much lesser. And why it is more important at the same time, if we look at the budget for Kendriya Vidyalaya and Navada Vidyalaya, the model central schools, in both the, uh, in both the uh, institutions, the budget has increased but they cater a very few number of children. Most of the government school children are going to, are basically are beneficiaries of Samagra Shiksha Abhijan. And we have also talked about the nutrition aspect. The nutrition midday meal uh, has come in a new after, it's a new name now. And it has also said that the pre-primary school children will now be, will come under the PM portion. So there is more coverage the scheme is going to, uh, I mean, more children, the scheme is going to cover, but at the same time, the budget has dropped. I mean, 2021-22, uh, uh, in the period of uh, pan pandemic, the budget was 11,500, but it has now decreased to 10,234 crore. The other important aspects is the question that we should ask whatever budget is given, how inclusive was this budget, whether there is any effort to inclusive recovery of education. So in this case, we, we need to 
to see what is there for girls for scheduled caste children scheduled tribe children children with disabilities because they are largely affected the most affected because of the pandemic there is only one scheme specific to girls that is national scheme for incentive to girls children for secondary education and this scheme is for scst girls who have passed class 8 the scheme got discontinued this year pre-matric scholarship for scheduled caste children and children of the families whose uh, parents are engaged with the unclean uh, the the manual scavenging occupation largely the the scholarship budget has decreased then scholarship for students with disabilities decreased the national child labor project which is important because whatever measures we largely what happened every time instead of taking preventive measures we go for curative measures and if the, if the incidence of out of children has increased and if there is so report says that child labor has increased the national child labor project has an important role to mainstreaming this child labor into the school education but there is a drastic budget cut from 120 crore to 30 crore Though I will not talk about higher education, just to mention that similar feature is uh, we can see for the uh, the scholarship schemes, the student financial aid in terms of loans to the students, and uh, then the, the PM Research Fellowship. If we clubbed all these together, the budget has again decreased. So the the kind of uh, cost, the direct cost benefits to scholarship stipends that directly help the children, which are enabled to. keep the students are uh, in the system retain them in the system those are the schemes have suffered a, a lot and last point i just want to mention because we i talked so much about the samagra shiksha vision because the scheme is so important for school education and all the interventions are going through samagra shiksha vision the budget has stopped whatever we have seen the budget the more focus is on digitization on online education uh there is announcement of uh, the digital teachers everything the most of the interventions are through samagra shiksha vision and other than that the only scheme that has been mentioned pm e vidya uh, that there is again under pm e vidya the budget has uh, uh, the, there is a cutting budget from uh, I, i i think it's from uh, i forgot the number but there is a budget cut huge budget cut in the under pm e vidya and uh, more importantly the proposal that uh, from 12 to 200 uh chat television channel again or you need to quote the government's own data department of school education's own survey that that during the last two years online education through television only 5.5% children actually use this media to uh, uh study i mean for learning they use this particular media then again what we are proposing that increasing the television channel where samagra shiksha abhiyan has got only 20% increase and the important fact is that of this samagra shiksha budget 88% is financed through education says now we shouldn't bother from where the resource is coming but why uh, it's bothering us because uh, uh, we have seen there is uh, increase in i mean projection for increase in tax revenue there is projection of higher economic growth and uh, at the same time we have seen the last years the whatever the education says is being projected would be collected 2000 crore less collection happened and that's why this scheme has got lesser uh, amount of resources so if there is not gross budgetary support for this key central sponsored scheme naturally it will affect the larger uh, population i mean school going population to a uh, to a larger extent and uh, and that's why Uh, it was it would, could have been more judicious to put this money on samagra shiksha a vision but uh, we couldn't see that rather we have seen through this the uh, the this announcement of online education etc which was silent but it has uh, somehow created a backdoor entry to privatization the process has started earlier last year we have seen the stars project of world bank this time there are two new projects under the nep has been announced one is exemplar one is aspar aspar is again going to be financed through adb money so uh, overall this is the situation of school education which we need to i mean uh, the budget has uh, doesn't give us much hope uh, but uh, the state budgets are coming so we hope that uh, the state will take some uh, i mean put some more resources for education sector otherwise 
uh, there would be it would be difficult for the uh, children to ba basically come back and uh, get back to the previous uh, level of learning and education thank you thank you uh, pratibha i mean now we can uh, thank you for highlighting some of the issues and uh, the fact that you know the central allocation or central contribution central government contribution to the education is uh, is coming down it has declined over the years and uh, that in what way it shows uh, the thinking on part of the uh, government um, uh, so let's uh, hear a little more, particularly in the context of higher education, as well as the larger education sector from Professor Mona Kare. Uh, uh, Professor Kare, uh, welcome uh, to make your presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. And let me begin, uh, first of all, uh, by thanking uh, Dr. Arjun and the IMPRI team for giving me this opportunity opportunity to share uh, my views uh, and be a part of this uh, highly learned panel. Uh, uh, Pravita has already talked a lot about uh, how the uh, budgetary allocations in the school sector per se have uh, uh, panned over a little longer period of time. Uh, so maybe I would focus a little more on the current budget and uh, uh, share my views as to what uh, were our expectations and where has the current budget uh, fell short of our expectations and uh, how we would like to see uh, some of the changes to be coming in future, if at all possible. Uh, not to say that with uh, the National Education Policy 2020, now in its second year of implementation and a little clearer picture of uh, how the implementation guidelines have been framed by the government, which shows the, uh, the uh, very uh, holistic, very expansive kind of a work which is required to be done in the education sector. The overall increase of this 11.86% that uh, the, the finance minister had been claiming uh, does it seem to be enough is one question that anyone would have asked. Also, uh, it is uh, very, very clear uh, after what Pravita has already shown us that we are going to be very far away from meeting the off repeated 6% GDP for education, uh, which has been eluding us for more than now uh, half of a century, if I may say so. Uh, so just uh, uh, when I was looking at the current budget, um, the first thing that comes to one's mind is to weigh it against the promises that have been made in the National Education Policy 2020. Uh, so looking at some of the critical areas which were highlighted in the policy that related to four E's of uh, increasing enrollments across board, trying to uh, um, achieve universalization of education, not just at the elementary level, but also at the secondary level, followed by equity and inclusion. So very, very uh, expanded definition of SEDGs, the socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, uh, to be including for the first time the transgender, to be expanded to children out of school, street children, children from the, uh, obviously the children from the socioeconomically backward uh, communities, which al always existed, but many more, uh, especially the uh, talented children, uh, uh, the especially able children, uh, all of them now coming into the fold of SEDGs in an expanded format. Uh, the third E, uh, which uh, the national education policy was very vocal about both in the school sector as well as in the higher education sector was the employability issue, the skills for employability. And lastly, of course, the excellence, that is the learning gaps, the learning crisis uh, that we often uh, read about in various reports and has continued to put us to shame 
uh, many a times at uh, global comparisons. Now with these four E's in picture, uh, if we look at how the current budget uh, has panned itself out to achieve uh, these, uh, uh, one uh, would see that there is an excessive focus on uh, uh, improving the digital infrastructure and moving from a face-to-face -face, uh, mode to a, a digital mode of education. Now, to what extent uh, this uh, is going to be helpful in a country like India, where the digital divide has uh, come to fore more so uh, as a stark reality during the pandemic? I am not uh, against any kind of uh, 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 digital infrastructure to be created uh, and uh, to be used as a supplementary means of uh, enhancing the access and learning for children who are uh, from a disadvantaged background or living in remote areas. But what we mean to say is we would have been very happy had there been some specific announcement and efforts at bringing the children back to the schools and how uh, they could have a more um, uh, holistic learning environment uh, created in the schools, uh, how there could have been better security uh, and better uh, counseling, nutritional support uh, being given to the schools, all of which they have been at a loss during the past two years and also in the previous years. Uh, now, the entire focus of uh, building the digital infrastructure for the rural areas, also the e-vidya program, be it by the one, one class, one TV channel, or, or uh, promoting uh, e-learning in various uh, languages, regional languages, uh, or uh, developing uh, various uh, other modes of e-learning, remote learning, uh, all of them uh, are welcome, but they could not have been enough uh, for what we were looking for in the current budget. And over-focus on improving the digital infrastructure and digitizing the whole education sector, particularly at the school level, may have its own costs to play in future. The other area uh, where one can see uh, the current budget to be focusing uh, is uh, skill-based education with uh, uh, 5,000 uh, 5, uh, uh, skill centers to be opened, the ITIs to be revamped, uh, an entire digital ecosystem to be developed for skilling, reskilling, upskilling, et cetera. All of this is certainly welcome. The National uh, Skills Qualifications Framework to be brought in line with uh, uh, the uh, industry needs. All of this uh, ideally is very welcome. But when you look at it uh, from the uh, current uh, needs, one can say that this sounds more like a strategic plan for the midterm or maybe the long term rather than a uh, budget which has to be put into immediate action. Uh, so what is that immediate budgetary action plan that one would have been looking for? So for that, let us take a very quick look at what, would, uh, what were the critical areas that demanded um, very specific uh, uh, financial, uh, uh, financial support as per the national education policy. To begin with, obviously the uh, early childhood care and education, which has been brought into the formal fold of school education for the first time with three to six years old of children uh, who were hardly in schools, formal schools so far. This, uh, this is a number which have, would have demanded a lot of uh, uh, specific support for Anganwadi's and the primary school systems to be upgraded, for the teachers to be trained, for the Anganwadi workers to be trained to take care of these children, uh, specific reading material, uh, equipment to be built, and more so the midday meal scheme, uh, which is not just going to include these uh, ECC each children, but also there was a talk of uh, expanding the midday meals to uh, include uh, a breakfast and also 
uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, near future to secondary school. So one would have liked to uh, hear something very specific in terms of how ECCE could have been uh, made stronger in the in the current budget. Uh, the second uh, is uh, something which Pravita had also pointed at uh, is the equity and inclusion issue. Uh, uh, she also talked about how uh, the girl children have been at a greater disadvantage during the pandemic. And not just to say so, the, the policy had also specifically talked about uh, two kinds of funds. One was the gender inclusion fund and also uh, the uh, inclusion fund uh, wherein some specific uh, facilities and scholarships were to be uh, given for ch gifted children, uh, children with special needs, the Divyang children, all of these uh, have, uh, as Pravita also pointed, many of the scholarships uh, have either been stopped, discontinued, uh, the allocations have reduced, mm, all of these certainly require a relook at. So health, nutrition, uh, mental well-being. Uh, of course, there was a talk about a national uh, mental health uh, uh, mission to be started, but uh, how far it will be able to be accessed by small children, uh, by uh, children in the schools, uh, even uh, students in the colleges is yet to be seen. Uh, the third area uh, where uh, one would have liked to see some greater uh, allocation or some specific at least allocation was with respect to teacher development and special uh, uh, trainings for teachers to equip themselves uh, for teaching for the 21st century, not just by utilizing the e-technology e or the digital technology um, for teaching learning, as an aid for teaching learning, but also to be able to provide uh, the holistic mentoring uh, to the students, which is much lacking you know, in, the, uh, in the schools uh, as well as uh, at the collegiate level. Uh, coming uh, to the uh, higher education sector, now if you look at the uh, budgetary allocations is always the major chunk of the budget has gone uh, to the school sector, uh, uh, about 60% of it has gone to the school sector and higher education, which in the past has had been witnessing a, a, a slight increase in its share, this time has seen a drop in its share. Uh, now, when we are talking about uh, higher education to be a propellant for competitive growth and taking India to greater heights when it comes to a global recognition, a fall in the share of higher education is also something what, which one may like to look at. Uh, more particularly, um, when we are looking at the uh, propositions that were made in the national education policy, uh, which talks categorically about increasing the GER in the higher education sector, uh, converting all the existing universities into large-size multidisciplinary universities uh, with greater emphasis on holistic and skill vocational uh, integrated education at the higher levels also. Uh, in the previous budgets, some skilled universities were opened, announced, but what is it that is going to happen to them now? Uh, we would have loved to see something more uh, about uh, them to be talked in this budget. Uh, also, the National Research uh, Foundation, which, uh, uh, which was a welcome uh, uh, proposition in the national education policy. We would have loved to see some specific research funds um, uh, also because during the pandemic, the research scholars at the higher education level have also suffered a lot in terms of uh, discontinued or lesser fellowships, uh, um, delayed fellowships, uh, uh, disrupted research, uh, uh, facilities, uh, access to libraries, etc. Uh, all of this, how it could have been um, helped out. Uh, in fact, there are uh, some very um, uh, contrary 
uh, allocations uh, that have been uh, that have happened in the current budget for example there is a big push which has been given to digital education with the announcement of a digital university and many other um, public institutions of higher approach to join that in a spokes and hub model uh, you know, with uh, so much of e content to be developed with the, uh, almost 750 e labs in maths and science and about 75 or so if i i remember the number correctly uh, e uh, labs for skills training to be opened etc and yet uh, the allocation for the dig national digital education has uh, seen a drop uh, which is um, which is certainly an irony when we are talking about so much of push to be given to digital education with so many propositions made in the budget uh, similarly uh, uh, the education policy talked about uh, promoting multidisciplinarity and now in the budget we are talking about opening uh, a few more uh, single uh, discipline kind of uh, uh, institutions and strengthening them, uh, all those strengthening of agricultural universities um, is, uh, is welcome in a country like India, but uh, uh, how uh, all of these universities could have been uh, made multidisciplinary is something that we were looking at. Uh, opening of some special courses announcing of some special courses in the fintech sector, financial management in the gift city. Uh, these are some, uh, some propositions which have been made or announcements which have been made in the budget, which uh, are, uh, we don't seem to fit in line with the, the, uh, the uh, propositions made in the new education policy. Also similarly, uh, the, uh, the tilt towards uh, uh, urban component of learning to be enhanced, like uh, uh, the urban design and architecture, urban planning institutes to be strengthened. So suddenly somewhere down the line, one finds that uh, there is a, a greater tilt towards uh, corporatization of both at the school as well as the higher education level. Because if you look at the digital, existing digi digital infrastructure uh, in the country, one would find that it is more uh, dominated by the private corporate sector, the, uh, the digital uh, education providers in the country uh, are more in the private sector. And if this kind of, uh, uh, a trend continues, uh, we might like to uh, question ourselves uh, if uh, the very uh, idea and spirit of quality uh, education for all and an inclusive education society uh, will become a reality in coming future or not. I think I will stop here uh, because uh, later, if there is time, I would like to uh, take two minutes maybe to uh, share where is it that we could uh, take uh, things uh, as per uh, our understanding. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Khare. And I think you have covered both the sectors uh, rather more than the two sectors, you have also gone to the area of skill uh, development and a variety of other issues uh, about which uh, I think you know we we also had uh, we also learned something from pro, um, uh, from Dr. Kundu uh, and uh, you know one aspect which you really pointed out, which is glaring that you know we have uh, the new education policy. And the direction that it uh, uh, it, it, it is likely to take us is somewhat missing in the budget. You know, it looks that you know the two are going on two parallel lines. You know, it's, we are reproducing what we have done in the past. Uh, the two areas which, in fact, I think all uh, everybody to take note of, our listeners to take note of. One is the fact that one was the differentiating aspect of this budget. Not that you know it was not talked about earlier. 
was the early childhood education, which in fact, uh, uh, you know, we have the very first few paragraphs from uh, Kothari Commission talks about early childhood, but, but perhaps, you know, we didn't have the resources at that particular point of time and whatever may have been the constraints, maybe we didn't have teachers. But the fact of the matter is that now that we, 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 we thought of integrating early childhood education with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the schools as well as with the Anganwadis, you know, what I was really looking at is, uh, and this is something, you know, which all of us need to, in fact, pay attention on, that while uh, the midday meal, which in fact would spread over other institutions and also include um, breakfast uh, and things of that sort, uh, the, the allocation there has come down. And uh, if one were to perhaps look at the, the allocation that uh, Ministry for Women and Child Development have received, you know, I have some statistics here. Uh, there is a decline from 2.46 to 2.35 crores uh, in the budget for the, uh, so for the Ministry of Women and Child uh, Development. Budgetary allocation for, uh, for Shakcham uh, uh, has gone down. Uh, that is particularly portion has been reduced by 11.28% uh, by from the earlier year. So in fact, uh, now while you know, we have this pandemic situation where children are the ones, and uh, uh, both of you, our earlier panelists, did talk about child labor. Um, so, Maybe you know our our problems are quite, and they needed to be prioritized, and that's where you know Professor Fahre you know pointed out that well these were the expectations, the girl children among those who have really dropped out, the girl children face uh, much greater um, challenges, in higher education you know we have these uh, problems of uh, fellowship, and while I may not be so much inclined to be. Uh, personally, I mean, talking about the National Research Foundations or whatever, because, you know, that has a kind of a top uh, controlling funding is on another thing. But uh, uh, the fact is that, you know, there is a lot that we need to really engage on several of these aspects, including uh, the fact that, you know, you know, we are, are we really going uh, towards privatization? in a much bigger way at this juncture when the question of equity, when the question of excess still remains to be addressed. So now what do you really make out of how the government understands equity and excess? Is it the digital uh, platform, which perhaps, you know, once created uh, would perhaps take care of everything, all those who are moving or dropped out or those who could not perhaps be brought within the within the spectrum of face-to-face -face education. And uh, the data that you know, we have from ground, I mean, especially working with nearly 600 some uh, panchayats that one of the organizations has been working, even during the pandemic is of the opinion that you know, the, the number of children who drop, dropped out in those panchayats is much bigger that, uh, and that not more than 8% or rather 14% what he shared with me, had any kind of an access on the digital platform. I mean, that was not a very regular one. So uh, I think, you know, I just summarized some of the points and also flagged off some of the issues which I would expect uh, Professor Chattopadhyay to take care of. Um, so over to you, uh, Professor Chattopadhyay. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sina. I don't know whether I can uh, do justice to the issues that you have raised. And I must thank uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar for giving me an opportunity again to participate in this uh, panel discussion along with my very esteemed panelist. Uh, what I would like to do uh, is to focus on two things. But before I uh, begin, I would try to make an I'd make an attempt uh, to understand the signals that are emanating from the union budget 22-22-22-23 for restructuring the higher education sector. I'll be focusing mainly on higher education sector, not mainly, but exclusively. And 
what is the vision that is getting articulated in the budget numbers? What is the signal? What is the logic behind this? So though the link apparently between the NEP 2020 and the budget numbers, the direction that they provide, is apparently weak, but I see that there is a link and the link has to be understood. First of all, the purpose of education is being revisited. What is the objective of education that is being reconceptualized? There are two major aspects that I would like to focus on. One is the education national skill qualification framework. And the second part of my talk would be on the digital university. Now, what is the purpose of education that I can make out from the budget numbers? One is that education is getting increasingly reoriented towards skill. The purpose of education is skill, and that is how education is going to contribute to the economic growth. Now, since independence, if I may argue that the growth has mainly been driven by the physical infrastructure development. So in this budget, when the government is going to bank on the increased momentum in the revenue collection, the tax collection, I mean, and to spend on capital expenditure, if you remember the initial part of the FM speech, the PM Gati Shakti, the focus would be on energy, the focus would be on urban, focus would be on therefore transport, the focus is on therefore capital expenditure. The focus is not on education and health. The focus is on infrastructure development. So the vision of attaining growth, which is inclusive, seems to be getting undermined, seems to be getting compromised because it is only the need for education to provide skilled labor force who can participate in the growth process. And the second, objective is to be a part of the global higher education, is to embrace the global higher education. And the third purpose of education, the way university purpose is being defined, though the signals are not prominent, but this is, I believe the future direction will be, one is that increase participation of the private sector in university affairs, PPP, and the university industry linkage. So these are the three, the skill, part of the global higher education and industry with increased private participation, PPP mode and in industry university linkage to be more stronger. So let me focus on the national skill qualification framework. National skill qualification framework, there are two major purposes. One is uh, Mona Ji has already talked about it. Uh, it is mainly to prepare the labor force for the need for industry. So there is a need for benchmarking of quality. There is a need for identification of the institutions. And this benchmarking of quality will also enable the students to exercise their freedom of choice of courses so that they can move from one to the other. Now, this has to be understood in the context of two very important statement, which is there in the NEP. National education policy says that the gross enrollment rate in higher education from the present 26, 27% to be raised to 50% by 2035. And this rise in the gross enrollment rate in higher education would be partly, would be uh, contributed to the extent of 50% by vocational education. So the thrust is very clear. The expansion of higher education in future will have to be driven primarily by increased participation in vocational education. You can also read one more statement in the NEP 2020 that says that only 5% of our workforce is trained in vocational education compared to 52% in the United States and 75% in 
in Germany. So the focus is very clear. Now the national skill, national skill qualification framework has to be juxtaposed with the academic bank of credit for which the government has shown enough seriousness in the recent past. There is a budgetary allocation. The draft regulation is already up on the website. Now, what does ABC, the academic bank of credit, seek to achieve and how does it get reconciled with the national skill qualification framework? Now, in ABC, students are being given the freedom to choose courses. Now, when we are talking about that we have to, the institutions have to be multidisciplinary. If you don't want to spend much on us, the higher education institutions, and still you are expecting us to be multidisciplinary, how do you achieve that? It's very simple. That you focus on digital education. You focus on the mobility of the students so that they can choose courses across the institution. And national skill qualification framework is one of the objective of the formation of the General Education Council, which is one of the four pillars of the regulatory framework. At the top is the HECI, Higher Education Commission of India, and that would be supported by four pillars. And one of the pillars is General Education Council. And the General Education Council is supposed to facilitate the free movement of the students in terms of the choice of courses between general education and vocational education. So how do you encourage students to go for vocational education? When you tell them that, look, you take up some courses which will enhance your employability. At the same time, you can pursue some courses from general education. So as I understand, you do sociology, you do history. At the same time, you also pick up some courses so that your employability is enhanced in the job market. You need not remain constrained by the discipline the employability potential of the discipline that you have chosen. There are now many windows and let the students can pursue the courses that they would think are useful for them or relevant for them. So when I'm arguing that there is a purpose of education which is getting redefined, whether it is global higher education to be a part of the global higher education or the education budget getting more and more skill oriented, the focus has to be on ICT. The focus has to be on digitization. The focus has to be on adoption of technology in the classroom. Without that, you cannot achieve both, neither skill nor a part of the global higher education. So in ABC, Academic Bank of Credit, the students can now opt for courses. And the purpose of ABC is to allow the student to have free entry, free exit, and the time duration of the courses that let the students decide so that you are helping the student to enter the job market without completing their courses and they can again come back and study parallelly and complete the course as well as be part of the job market so this link between education and job market is going to be strengthened because of the skill and the flexibility that is being provided to the students now this academic bank of credit and national skill qualification framework, both need a thrust on the digital technology. Now, digitization has been a, a very favorite policy objective world over in some of the countries. What does it do? It achieves expansion of the education sector at a cost which is relatively lower because of the possibility of expanding the classroom by transcending the boundaries of the classroom. And you can reach remote and you can increase the flexibility, the freedom to choose the courses. All these things are very essential. Now this pandemic disrupted our classroom teaching. We had to transit to online teaching part force. So, the NEP 2020 announced end of July, followed by some of the public notices issued by the UGC, make it very clear that since we move to online, 
let the momentum be sustained let us capitalize on the gains that you have made from making a transition to the online of course we were not prepared students are still not prepared the digital divide continues to be very very relevant for us and we are finding it difficult in the online teaching the kind of interaction we think that we should have are not happening but there is a force nevertheless so the ugc letter says in august 2020 and later on another letter from the ugc public notice they say that look let the students take 40% of the credit from soyom platform the other e platforms or other universities so the options before the students are being expanded and why digital education helps in this purpose because the transaction cost of mobility is drastically reduced and this thrust on digital technology is also going to help us achieve a part of the global higher education what is a digital university now before we understand a digital university let us understand i mean all of us know all of us realize it but it's short of uh, mentioning it once again what does online education do to our classroom teaching first of all the classroom walls cease to be of any relevance so the moment we are in a virtual platform we are virtually in a global classroom the classroom can be global right it's not only national it's a global this seminar is also global potentially speaking so that means the students number can increase second this lectures can be recorded and can be converted to a digital product so a service which is extinguished once the classroom once the class period is over and we leave the classroom is now a digital product and third the government says and those who advocate digital education they also argue the same that the quality can be enhanced because the quality teaching quality content can be replicated at a very low marginal cost in number of times that is the beauty of digital education and that can be achieved which means that the students can now get good quality education sitting in their remotest part of the country remotest of the villages because of online education it's a different matter that the digital connectivity is poor and all but that is the vision which is coming up now because of the digital education what is happening because of the online education what is happening the space time and quality associated with education are getting redefined the university space doesn't matter is insignificant now the classroom is insignificant now right and the classroom and the university space are not being considered to be significant not being considered to be of importance or relevance which means the purpose of education is skill purpose of education is not to socialize not to let them socialize not to let them appreciate the diversity not to let them understand each other and the space for the student as a form of to to express dissent to participate in activities right all these things will shrink they have already shrunk and they will shrink further now digital university means that was mona ji was already trying to explain that some of the best universities will connect so is a digital university means there is no need for any campus there is no need for just barely a office will do it will just connect the teachers and the students from all over the world so that they can gain from each other's expertise gain from each other's knowledge collaborate and achieve excellence they get a taste of excellence now this is where the question which is important for us that is the aspiration to participate in the global higher education good for the indian higher education overall now why i am saying that there is a very clear thrust for global higher education in the budget there are three more signals which have to be understood the budget for internationalization i am not going to share my excel sheet now 
Pratiba has done a job, but this is for my higher education. If you look at the budget for internationalization, you will see the revised estimate is exactly equal to the budget estimate for 21-22. What does it mean? It means the budgetary allocation of 160 crore for internationalization is supposed to be spent by 31st of March within one and a half months. That means the signal has been given that you spend the budget. So when you look at the budget, I always look at, or we should always look at the budgetary estimate and the revised estimate and budget estimate for the next year. Because how the money has been spent, true, we had the second wave, true, we had the disruption, but the signal is clear. So you will find but certain items, the revised estimate is very close to the budgetary estimate. For certain items, revised estimate has exceeded the budgetary estimate. And how we are projecting the budgetary estimate for 22, 23. All these are important signals. So internationalization, yes. If you look at the budget for world-class university, which is in Institute of uh, Eminence, uh, Institution of uh, em Eminence, IOE, uh, the world-class university, the revised estimate was much less. It was around 1700 they couldn't spend. But the budgetary estimate over revised estimate shows a jump of 41%. That means let the budget, budgetary allocation be directed towards the select set of universities which have been accorded the status of institution of eminence to aspire to be a part of the world ranking, to be aspire to be a part of the world higher education. Then you also look at the newspaper report, the Radhakrishnan committee, the international branch campuses are going to be set up, being mooted, uh, and IIT Delhi has already submitted something and our JNU VCs is also part of the committee. So what they're going to do is to explore how some of the best universities, best institutions of a country can open, uh, open campuses abroad, particularly in the Middle East. It can be Egypt or it can be Egypt and, and, and the Middle East. So digital university, international branch campuses, world-class university, internationalization, the budget for uh, this uh, global management, there's a head call uh, planning administration for global management. All these budget very in, indicate very clearly that let us be a part of the global. And that aspiration uh, of setting up a world-class university uh, when it was mandated. Uh, our prime minister made it very clear we should be part of because we are second or third largest in the world today, and we don't feature very prominently in the world ranking. So the the objective is very very clear. So I would end my uh, talk by reflecting on: Is globalization good? Uh, the budget has already been shown, but I don't know whether I should uh, share certain numbers, but. Uh, let me uh, let me do it. Uh, I'll take a, only a minute or so if it is feasible. Pratibha has already talked about it, so I don't want to go into the details. Uh, you see, the school it's it's a very hodgepodge. I have not uh, cleaned up the table, but school net of recoveries, higher education net of recoveries. If I'm comparing the budgetary increase, the column aim over the revised estimate, you will see the higher education budget does show, uh, I mean, the education budget overall does show an increase of 18.5%. But revised estimate by budgetary estimate, we could not spend enough. So 5.6% uh, fall for school, 5.3%, for higher education, 6% fall. Uh, so these are the figures. But here you look at, how we are projecting the future, budget by budget, budget 22 by budget 21, for education as a whole, 12% rise, school 16%, but for higher education, the rise is merely 6%, right? Now look at the grant to the central universities. Uh, we spent a little more as per the budget, so 23% rise, budget by budget. Uh, IISC, 17%, IISAR, 46%. IIM 37%, IITs is much less, 9%, NIT 11 but UGC is only 4%, right? So UGC is not the priority, it's very clear. And this is what I was trying to argue, the internationalization 25%, study in India, 
the national mission ICT, it's a significant jump, 400 crore budgetary estimate, whereas the budgetary estimate for this year, 21, 22 was nearly 150. So it's a significant jump. We could not spend what we budgeted for, but now there's, a, and we are going to do away with HIPAA. And this is the world-class university budget, 1200 crore uh, revised, and we are going to spend 1700 crore. Now, is globalization good? Is globalization bad? It's very difficult question, uh, I believe. Uh, we have to look at the higher education system as a whole, the way it is being restructured, it is getting more and more differentiated. It is getting more and more differentiated because NEP has talked about it, research university, teaching university, degree granting colleges and all. And when you have the world ranking universities, the WCU, world class university, they should prioritize global over national, over local. It's bound to be the case because that is why they have been mandated to achieve. If you look at the national and state level universities, you have to prioritize the local over the national and national over the global. Now, what is happening therefore, because of this increasing uh, uh, differentiation within the higher education sector, the quality differences will get more acute. So the access is a very big question because the tuition fees, the, 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 the thrust on cost recovery, the tuition fee, all are likely to rise over a period of time and that the government will also standardize the allocation of budget through the HEGC, the Higher Education Grants Council in future. So in future, therefore, the excellence is to be measured in terms of the global purpose of education is skill and university are supposed to contribute more to the industry. It's a different matter whether the industry and the market will truly reflect the need of the society for which the university should primarily be concerned with. That's a different issue uh, seems to be for the government. But as Pradeepa was trying to mention that, uh, you see, uh, given the thrust for capital expenditure and given the massification of higher education and inflation, the increase is not much. At least, at least the budgetary pronouncement, the FM speech is not for education, is not for health. Possibly the momentum will be sustained and I fear that education budget, even if it is there, some sort of increase in the budgetary allocation is unlikely to be realized because the thrust is that digitization and the digitization will help us achieve to produce more skill by giving opportunity to the students to be part of the global, often at the expense of the national and the local interest. And, and Monaj has already said that, you know, because of the possible uncertainty, there is no budgetary allocation for National Research Foundation. Possibly this year, uh, the government will try and see how the UGC can be uh, restructured to become HEGC as per the vision of the NEP. Let me stop here. Thank you, Professor Sina. I'm through. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shaman Chattopadhyay mm -hmm. for having thrown um, uh, light on some of the uh, aspects of uh, the higher education or maybe education in general, the vision of the, in the coming years as to how it's going to be reshaped. Uh, what are the signals and which direction the budget is trying to take us? Uh, uh, thank you for uh, throwing uh, a significant light on uh, these aspects. Uh, we'll come back to you, we'll come back to Monaji and we'll, uh, but in the meanwhile, let's have uh, uh, Dr. Suresh uh, ready to, for his presentation. Uh, over to you, Professor uh, Dr. Reddy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sinha. Just I would like to uh, supplement uh, already what uh, Dr. Ko, Kundu or Professor Kare and uh, Professor Chetopadhyaya uh, mentioned. Uh, basically, I would like to uh, 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 focus on that, you know, uh, school education, especially the budget allocation and utilization you know, over a period of time. If you see, we have been talking about uh, since 1965 Kotari Commission, uh, further the subsequent uh, natural education policies, you know, uh, talking about 6% of GDP has to be allocated for the education. So the apart from that, the right to education, uh, that is 2009, the act we enacted in the parliament is almost all now the 12 years of time. And if you see that, um, uh, 
uh, uh, as per the uh, recent in parliament uh, response, one of the questions, uh, the minister mentioned that 25.5% of the, the schools are complying the RTE standards and norms, and still the 74.5% of the schools are not able to meet the standards and norms of the Right to Education Act after 12 years of time. And in between, that is a, a couple of years back, the national education policy, which announced, and that it, this also talks about like uh, uh, the 6% of GDP has to be allocated for the education. But so far, uh, uh, it is uh, around 3%, you know, that is the level currently the allocations are being uh, made. Apart from that, if you see that the, the pandemic last two years, how it played a role of, you know, the promote the, the learning gap among the, the children and the nutritional gap as well as well-being. This is uh, unexpected, uh, the pandemic uh, across the country. It derailed the, the progress of the education, what we have been making, and especially the children uh, lost the learning, what they learned earlier, instead of learning new things, next level things, they lost the, uh, the learning also. So, uh, and also the government of India also has the national flagship program, Beti Bachao and Beti Padao. That is the uh, uh, campaign uh, we have been uh, seeing that uh, year on year to promote the girls' education. And especially during the pandemic situation, how, uh, especially the children of the secondary, senior secondary students, you know, how they uh, missed the education and uh, uh, dropping out from the schools, you know. So, uh, so that are the things, one is the allocation of the budget is uh, low. Uh, second thing is uh, meeting up the RTE uh, responsibilities at uh, 25% level and uh, the pandemic of two years of havoc and um, uh, the many things, you know. And also apart from this, the utilization of the budgets, you know, uh, irrespective of the union government or the state governments and uh, at the end of the year, if you can see that um, because of the, the poor governance, you know, uh, the, whatever the limited budget allocated, the same budget also not 100% able to utilize it. That is the, the issue of the governance, one has to look at it. With this background, if you see that um, during this uh, pandemic situation, the education system, the school education system, if we structure them into four levels, one is that the high end, the private schools. Second one is uh, the Navodaya Kendriya Vidyalayas, uh, run by the central government, as well as uh, uh, the state government schools across the country and the low cost budget private schools. Out of these four, uh, especially the last two segments, the uh, state education board schools and uh, low cost uh, budget private schools. These are the schools where the children are studying. They suffered a lot because of the digital divide. When the schools are shut for the two years, uh, at least the education was happening uh, in high end private schools and the Kendriya Navodaya Sainik schools, where uh, some level of the digital infrastructure, digital capabilities, and um, uh, the content availability, you know, and being the medium of education is English. So because of these things, they, they, uh, these schools didn't miss much uh, compared to the, uh, the, the second two categories of the schools where they struggled a lot, almost all. Uh, only the studies shows that 8% of the uh, children got the online learning education opportunity in government schools and 42% of children they never uh, get an opportunity of using the digital platform for the education as for the university of study. And also what Ajim Premji Foundation study says that uh, 60 to 90% of the uh, learning loss for the children. In this context, uh, the budget of the union government of 2022-23, giving some focus to the uh, uh, digital, uh, especially uh, one uh, TV per one class, you know, like that, it had to be in regional languages, 200 channels, the e-content, virtual labs and e-labs. This is, uh, uh, I can say, it's in a welcome move uh, because of, as per the changing times, we are uh, uh, dealing with the, the generation of alpha, you know, the, the, and the generation of Z. These are the children. Uh, they are very much um, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, familiar or very much uh, quick user of the, the technology and that will be interactive technology. So compared to our uh, millennials or uh, generation AX, uh, these are the segments our teacher community belongs to. So when compared to this uh, generation X, millennial uh, uh, age group of the, the teachers, uh, the generation Z and generation alpha, the children, they are much, much more ahead of uh, in using the technology and uh, uh, learning things. So from that perspective, so what the union budget uh, is giving the emphasis for the digital based education. But again, here I have a couple of observations. So one is uh, when you say virtual labs and e labs, which are more kind of desirable things, as Sir Chattopadhyay just mentioned, that how the digital technologies can bring down the cost and also it facilitates the the pan india global level collaborations and uh, the learning and uh, beyond the four walls of classrooms is a very good thing when come to the the one tv one classroom you know this is uh, outdated actually if you see that this is not the new to the education system way back almost all 20 years back the government of india has launched the uh, satellite based education uh, setting up the tvs in the schools and uh, having the studio at the state capitals uh, telecasting the education in today's context uh, whatever the the current in the market uh, the content available in this that is uh, interactive in nature unless until you have a digital device in your hand either laptop or desktop or mobile phone or a tablet you know uh, you, you can't use that content currently available in the market. But the TV medium we're talking about, it's more kind of monologue, the one way, one the passive learning kind of situation. And uh, the children of this generation, uh, if they have to glue to this uh, TV based education, unless the content is very rich, uh, which is uh, better than the, the multimedia content and better than the uh, the cinema content, what you see, that kind of thing, you know, other people, children won't pay attention to that. So how this uh, one TV, one classroom uh, channels uh, produce the content, which is better in quality and, you know, attracts the children to the, uh, the glue to the TV and uh, the, any digital devices to make use of it. That is a challenging thing when I have to look at it. And second thing, in the regional languages, this is a very good move. So currently, whatever content is available, it is mostly in English and in Hindi, but not the regional languages of either South India or West India or East and Northeastern India kind of thing. So the regional languages channels is very good move, but need to focus on the, the content part. But I do, I, but I, I, I wish to hear that this government has to have um, even much more, you know, like a transformational uh, 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 reforms or uh, the allocation of the budget as to look at it, how to equip the schools, uh, especially the digital access, the infrastructure, which is a, a huge, huge gap. And digital capabilities of the teachers, as I mentioned that these teachers belongs to either millennial or generation X uh, uh, sections, you know, group. And uh, uh, out of this uh, group, if unless until their capabilities are enhanced and they may not, not able to match the, uh, the expectations of the uh, generation G and generation alpha. So that the capabilities of the digital capital teachers need to be enhanced. That is the one thing we have to focus. And uh, 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 other than this, you know, uh, uh, the digital assessment uh, part. Uh, that is also one has to look at it in a, in a holistic manner. So I, with these comments, I would like to uh, stop it here uh, with uh, one comment to say that, you know, uh, whatever is happening, it is happening in an incremental way, but we need to have the, the transformational uh, focus in allocation and uh, bringing the reforms and the governance, governance issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, for bringing in uh, uh, two uh, besides many other points, you know, you really pointed out that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the three segments which really need to be emphasized. One is, of course, you know, the, the, the process of transformation as to how uh, this vision could perhaps, you know, the vision that Professor 
Shaman Chattopadhyay, which is also uh, seen. I mean, through him, you know, one could see that it is built into the budget in some way or the other. Uh, but you also pointed out as to uh, where the learning gaps have been greater. And uh, can we really take care of these without having a kind of a traditional conventional classroom? Because at the early level, you know, you, you can't perhaps, you know, uh, we know even in the best of the uh, households with all the gadgets, the learning processes, although there is no survey of that kind, uh, but through whatever that we have been in a position to interact with our family members, our relatives, you know, they, 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 they do say that, you know, for, especially for the, for the primary and the upper primary, there has been a tremendous loss. Uh, it's true that here, yeah, the, the generation, which in fact, uh, the current generation is more tech, uh, technology savvy, you know, they can be, perhaps, you know, they can adapt to those situations, but then there are, you know, we, we do, we have a vision, but we don't really have a demonstrated kind of an, uh, a proof to say, okay, you know, that this can happen this way, you know, neither in India nor anywhere in the world. So these are larger issues, you know, but you have really pointed out some of these questions and uh, these questions will have to be uh, looked at and debated upon. I think Professor Kare wanted to, wanted to have some two or three minutes more for uh, something that she wanted to share. Uh, uh, Professor Kare, yeah. You wanted uh, towards you. the end of your presentation, you said that maybe later I'll, I'll, yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll you just have take a minute. Minutes. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so I just want to end by saying, after listening to all the learned panelists also, that uh, we may claim this budget to be futuristic in spirit, uh, but certainly it appears to be a lopsided one and also a biased one in my opinion. Why I say so is uh, because uh, when we are talking about, when we are aiming for a holistic quality education for all, uh, then uh, even for a quality futuristic uh, education uh, to be uh, available, uh, there are three kinds of major resources uh, where the focus should have been. The human resources, the the physical resources and the digital resources. But the current budget seems to be uh, more focused on digital resources. Also, if we look at uh, the, uh, the uh, relative shares of uh, a school and higher education and further bifurcation uh, when it comes to uh, scheme-based uh, uh, allocations and non-scheme-based allocations, we find that in this school sector, the major share goes to the skill uh, scheme based uh, allocations with Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan getting the uh, major pie of the entire allocation. And we have already seen um, a lot of reports uh, about the, uh, the concerns when it comes to uh, Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan. Provita has also pointed out about uh, the underutilization of the funds uh, and also. Uh, despite an increase which has been promised this year, we are not very sure whether it will ever uh, happen uh, as per the previous experiences or not. If we look at the higher education sector again, uh, uh, we see that uh, more than 99% of the share is marked for revenue and a mere uh, 18, 18 point some crore uh, against uh, 40,000 plus crores uh, for revenue and 18.1% uh, or some crore for the capital uh, expenditure. So how, uh, and we all know that a major proportion of the revenue expenditures so far in the higher education sector have been spent on the salaries and uh, maintenance uh, uh, of the uh, sector. And there is very little left for developmental activities in the higher education sector. So that is again, uh, something which has uh, happened for a very long time. And when we are talking about revamping the entire higher education sector, uh, there is need to see how we can uh, increase the capital expenditures here as well. 
Also why I call uh, this to be biased is because uh, we find that uh, most of the uh, attempts, uh, be it uh, the world-class institutions, uh, the world-class universities, uh, uh, the uh, elite institutions to be part of the hub and spokes model uh, or the uh, very niche uh, courses, uh, be they the AI based courses or uh, the uh, FinTech based courses, which are which have been uh, specifically uh, highlighted and pronounced in the uh, budget uh, uh, would certainly be uh, limited uh, to a very um, uh, few uh, uh, sections of the student population. So by and large, if we see uh, then uh, what Pravita had also mentioned, uh, we need to question ourselves, uh, are we uh, shying away to open doors or uh, to open doors to quality education uh, for the larger masses of our students and in our attempts to be uh, globally competitive or futuristic, uh, we are in some way uh, uh, losing out on being more inclusive. Also, just uh, by my last sentence, we understand that uh, the budget, uh, budgetary, um, like the money is always limited and we cannot have everything. There is so much on the platter, uh, but certainly uh, we need to prioritize uh, by way of maybe adopting a three-point formula as to look at the most vulnerable sections of the populations, the vulnerable groups, be it the out-of-school children, the transgender, the, the young, or the SEDGs living in the remotest of locations, uh, more vulnerable regions. There was a hint of uh, aspirational districts to be touched by the Honorable Finance Minister in her speech, but not specifically uh, for education per se in these districts. Uh, so um, maybe something specific about uh, uh, horizontal equalization funds um, and uh, also the third that is to focus on more vulnerable facilities and activities. So when we are talking about a more integrated uh, uh, curriculum development with both vocational and skill-based and uh, uh, academic curricula to uh, to what also Professor Somain was referring as to how we can bring a greater integration between the two. So that curricular integration and certainly teacher development, which uh, which needs to be uh, uh, focused upon if we want to make our entire education system both globally competitive and also inclusive in nature. Thank you, Professor Sena for that uh, second round of my... <laughs> no, uh, thank you. That, that round sharing. is open to everybody. Uh, all the other panelists, if they would like to add something uh, to what has already been presented, uh, you're most welcome because, uh, you know, the chair cannot really choose to be partial, you know. Uh, uh, so I'm going first. I just want to, yeah. what Mona said, other than that, two points. I mean, uh, so in this quasi-federal structure, what message Indian government is giving, that is very important. It matters. And we have seen during the Sachata vision, what the uh, Indian government is doing, most states are following the same thing. And similar thing in this budget, we have seen so much focus on digitization. We will see again in the planning, in the expenditure pattern, probably states will going to uh, prioritize again uh, these interventions. But uh, as uh, everyone has, uh, I mean, Mona has said, uh, Sureshji has said that school is not basically only the place of learning, it's a space of uh, socialization. So learning comes later. First, it's important to uh, retain the children in the system. So reintegration of school is more important. And uh, the states now, I mean, union, gov union budget is over, now state budgets are coming. Hopefully states will now give some priority. And for that, a uh, strong leadership and political willingness is important. But other than all these things, what is more important, we should have more data because data is a serious problem now in the social sector. 
so accessibility availability and quality data if it is not there then it would be very difficult to uh, make policy analysis uh, do policy suggestions so uh, i think i mean now it has time also to uh, devote some resources more on uh, data uh, data part i mean gathering data and maintaining those data and that should be in the public domain thank you So please unmute, Sachi sir. Shaman, would you like to add something? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. I have uh, a question for uh, Pratibha or all the panelists. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I agree and that the comprehensive picture can only be obtained after we have a look at the state budget because, you know, the center and the state together would give us a complete picture of the budgetary allocation for education and higher education. But I believe Putipa knows better. She is dealing with the budget uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, the states are more fiscally constrained. I mean, the fiscal crisis is more acute in, at the state level. For the center, it is li little less, though 6.4% is the target of the fiscal deficit. But you know, the thrust has been made very clear. Let us go for physical infrastructure and social infrastructure can continue. My second uh, clarification that I would like to seek from Pratibha and all other panelists, how crucial is the distinction between revenue and capital expenditure? You see the focus is capital, capital, but for education and health, uh, the revenue expenditure, uh, I think, you know, at, at least I can share you, uh, share from my experience and Professor Sina can also uh, join. The, the basic expenses which are required to be incurred other than the salaries for the education sector have drastically been reduced. Salaries, okay, I mean, but the infrastructure related basic maintenance, it's not capital, basic maintenance expenditure is drastically yeah. reduced. And so, I mean, uh, the state and the center and the revenue and the capital and the salary expense and non-salary expense, which is extremely crucial, particularly how to revamp the infrastructure in the classroom. I'm not talking about JNU, uh, we are reasonably well placed, I suppose, but I'm talking about the entire country, the state and the center, uh, other central universities and state universities in particular. There has to be significant budgetary allocation for uh, to, to equip us digitally, the teacher and the student, so that we can restore some semblance of meaningful teaching learning process that used to take place in our classroom. That's all. Yeah, so uh, in a way, what uh, 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 Dr. Reddy, would you like to have the yes, last word? Yes, <laughs> I would like to add the Professor Chattopadhyay, you know, saying that um, unless until there is a political will and determination from the uh, ruling party, you know, uh, to give the priority to the education sector, it is happening some places here and there, for example, in Delhi, it is happening in Andhra, it is happening in Telangana, it's happening with dedicated efforts to, uh, uh, to boost the education. Here we talk about the capital expenditure. Once, as the professor said over there, mentioned about the, the maintenance part. We are talking about the RT, you know, just only 25% of the schools are meeting compliance, uh, meeting the uh, norms. 75% schools don't meet in the norms of the RT so far. So I'm talking about only maintenance part. If uh, other than the maintenance, if you want to actually create a good classroom with the furniture, a green boards, libraries, and labs, all those things, you know, it requires huge capital. When you talk about digital point of view, it is a, at this point of time, that thing is a desirable thing and it requires even much more than that. So most of the budgets are going for the revenue point of view, the salaries, running expenses point of view, because we have been as a foundation working in 24 locations in 12 states, working with the government schools. So on a pragmatic point of view, when we work there, the physical transformation of the school, the academic transformation and digital transformation, we look at it from those perspectives and it requires huge, huge money for the physical transformation and digital transformation. Unless until there is a increased allocation of the budget and political will is, is not there, we always we are talking about to just to maintain the status quo. Day by day, it is a deteriorating the situation and those who are the affordable and they are going to the private school system, but those who are not affordable, they are struggling and uh, the gap is increasing day by day. 
so this is these are my comments uh, officer thank you so i think you know the the panelists are almost unanimous about the fact that you know uh, uh, a lot would depend upon uh, how the state makes uh, uh, takes care of the requirements even today uh, in spite of the fact that and, and particularly today and the years to come not even uh, particularly in the light of the fact that you know there are marginalized sections of the population and uh, which cannot perhaps benefit them even digitally uh, and the numbers have gone up over the years because of the fact that you know there has been uh, unemployment rates are going up families have lost their jobs children are in great crisis i mean perhaps you know the, these figures that uh, uh, protiva was talking about needs to be collected there has to be a much deeper analysis in spite of the fact that okay we could be having a vision uh, which could be transforming transforming the the education sector in years to come we are we really i mean my question would be uh, to all the panelists are we or do we have sufficient indications internationally to say that well this this vision would work or we are becoming uh, guinea pigs in the field of education and the ict uh, i really don't know but uh, whatever little that I know is that you know we are perhaps the later part is is a much uh, uh, captures this whole thing where being such a huge country with such huge population perhaps you know the 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 experiment will, is more is more likely to be done here uh, whether at the, on the scale of digitizations and so on and so forth. What I have understood is that you know the digitization could perhaps be be a good supplement. It cannot be the thing, you know, which perhaps through which even those skills which are really required to be imparted could be imparted. I mean, you require those interaction between teachers and students. Uh, our experience in the last two years with digital platforms being used is very, very limited. I think, you know, the, the, the kind of facilities that you have elsewhere even in India, you know, through interactive kind of classrooms and all that, which in fact, our Google classrooms also provide. But my experience has been that in out of the 60 or 70 students that I've been teaching in a particular class, not even five of them, they really ask you questions, you know, there is no interaction that happens. And you lose your spirit of interaction, because you are speaking against a wall, you know, so, 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 I mean, my my larger question is, okay, you may not, you may not raise flags, or you may not become a source of uh, socialization or, or or dissent, but what will eventually happen to the society? The society cannot be made of atomized individuals. You know, uh, these are places of interaction: school, colleges, marketplaces. Uh, can uh, society be really reduced to? So there's a larger question which I'm not going into uh, that will require yet another session uh, uh, for all of us to perhaps look at it. Uh, the Our limited uh, agenda today was to in fact look into the direction in which 22-23 education budget is trying to take us. And I think you know we have had fairly good amount of understanding of that. And uh, there are concerns. I think you know uh, what uh, um, Dr. Reddy was trying to point out that, in spite of the SSA and the RTE, we really haven't really achieved the goal where you know we could provide that minimum physical facilities across to our students in the rural areas, uh, largely in the rural areas. I mean, we 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 know that. I mean, so. Uh, and that really calls for a large amount of capital expenditure. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we also have uh, to, in fact, reckon with the fact that you know there are schools being closed down, and most of these schools are, which are being closed down in the name of rationalization are being closed down in areas which are tribal areas, where areas which are where you know the mountainous areas where you can't really think about having a size of population. But you know the statistics that I have from nearly about 600 
which I was really looking at in the last three, four days, uh, tells me that even 250, schools with 250, 270, 300, 400, a strength of students have been closed down, you know, in, 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 in a kind of a rationalization program. And I have the, uh, and I'm checking that at the, at the, at the, uh, uh, with the UDIAS data also. And it seems to be supporting the fact that UDIAS itself has shown as to what has happened at the block level, that number of schools have come down, you know. So there are pockets, you know, where, and most of these pockets are largely in areas where you do not have political articulation. Uh, you have a huge pro program going on since 19, uh, 2017. I mean, so these are questions, you know, which we have to perhaps also address alongside. And uh, uh, well, these are larger issues, but I think, you know, they also would get reflected in, uh, in the budgetary allocation that. Um, so if the organizers would like to have some questions from the participants, uh, if you can allow, and if our panelists still have the strength to hold on, uh, I have no issues. So, <clears throat> I can ask a question. There, there please, are no questions please, there. please, please. Uh, so that panelists can also take half a half minute, one minute to also provide right, right, forward. Right. Uh, so this budget was also at India at 75, and now the budget is envisaging for India at 100, uh, Ambit Kal budget as it is. So my question to all the panelists was that does this budget now is also laying or envisaging the, the aim of our Vishwa Guru? Uh, how are we <clears throat> going ahead with that? Do we have any roadmap or what do you feel or what should can be done? Because all the panelists also touched, we have a tinkering lab, imprint and so many things also going on, MOOC courses by our top institutions and also private sector, we are trying to crowd in by uh, world-class institutions and others. So how are we moving towards uh, being the Vishwa Guru because there is China and other countries also coming uh, um, so much. So that was my question and we can also uh, incorporate the way forward. Amrit Kal, budget and so how do Yeah, who would like to perhaps, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, my my if you if you allow me, I'm taking the privilege so of can, being the chair. You can, you but can, but 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 I think you know let let I'll let others come in first, and then I'll I'll reflect upon it. So Professor Kare, Professor Shaman, uh, Doctor Reddy, anybody? Yes, Doctor Kundu, anybody? Yeah, if you want to say Vishwa Guru, then in what context is it? about the innovations uh, perspective or the learnings perspective or the, the standards of the, the school system uh, uh, or governance or the facilities point of view. So we have to define that from which was Vishwa Guru. From my, uh, from my side, I just say that uh, at least uh, innovations point of view, we can become a Vishwa Guru. I will give example. Uh, the, when we did a, a program called uh, uh, Teachers Tri-Science Program, it talks about uh, any speech science teacher who is interested, you know, who can learn from globally and also who can tell the globe that how the science can be taught by uh, using that platform. To use that platform in India, it requires in the schools so, uh, the digital uh, uh, infra connectivity, the power, the net uh, teachers' capability, and the science lab equipment. If we don't have all those things, how do you do that? To teach the rest of the world how to teach science using the low cost, no cost materials, you know, teach science and develop the, the lesson plans and that we can upload to the, uh, the global portal we're talking about to the rest of the world without having the, what I mentioned earlier and the uh, things, but still you teach the science. So where the innovation, you know, uh, where the, you use that your local environment, the, the stuff available, the low cost, no cost materials. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, somebody can take the compilation of those things and upload the, the portal. I become a Vishwa guru, you know. So till such time, everybody thinking of, if you want to use that platform, you need to have all these things X, Y, Z. But uh, India as a, a, as a country, here we know the art of, tell the rest of the world with the minimal resources, 
with using our creativity and uh, how we can demonstrate that uh, uh, in our thinking process and demonstrating. So that is one thing, one area we practically had experience and demonstrated and the full potential is there. The second thing is that now there is an Atal Tinkering Labs. These are the labs is promoted by the Niti Aayog across the country, both in private and government schools, where how to help the children and the educators uh, down the line next five, 10 years of time, seeing the, what is going to happen, promote the future skills, where they can tinker, where they can tinkering and also using the design thinking process. There is no one way you have to think in a prescribed kind of thing. It is the children and the educators coming together and tinker and using design thinking process, come up with the uh, prototypes which can solve the problems of the current situation. So uh, these are the two examples that I am here, uh, quote, and I'm saying that we have the potential and uh, yes, we can become the Vishwa Guru uh, with, uh, 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 with a vision and a mission and do things, you know, I stop it here. Thank you. Amen, sir. Please. Okay. Okay. Let me, uh, it's a very good question, Arjun. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, put India in the context of global higher education. 2019, India produced 101,87,000 papers, wave of science recognized, and India was fourth in the world after USA, China, and UK. Uh, fifth position was uh, Germany uh, in terms of the total number of paper published. But in terms of the citation index, India was 12th in the world. So there is always a concern between what we are producing and whether commensurate qualities are getting reflected in what we are producing. Now, are we producing enough? If you look at the size of the Indian higher education, then 1.4 million teachers are producing 1,90,000 papers. And then a significant part of the papers are also being contributed by the research institutions, specialized research institutions. So the per capita production of paper is pretty low, but the issue is like this. The issue is that the expenditure on research, expenditure on R&D as noted by the NEP 2020 is abysmally low in the case of India. So the research fund are mainly for the research institutions under the different ministries, but colleges and universities, we are not getting adequate funds. I am a social scientist. I'm talking about the scientist physics, chemistry, biology, and the, the natural scientists, they are not getting adequate funds from the public, uh, from the UGC to carry out their research. They are looking forward to the industry, but if you look at the total volume of research fund that should be infused into the system to make us more vibrant, innovative, because the size is huge. You must understand that we are having 1,000 universities and 50,000 1,000 university, 50,000 colleges, plus a good number of standalone institutions. Huge size. NRF, I don't know how NRF is going to meet the demand, just single body, right? So the budget is not there. Possibly in the next year, the budget will get reflected for NRF. So that if you want to build up, lay a sound foundation of research, given the educational pyramid, I think we need to spend more on school education, more on the foundation. The foundation is fragile and you are focusing on the elite part that is a top uh, section of the higher education system to be part of the global. I believe you can count the citation and say that, okay, we are part of the global higher education, but if the foundation is weak, and I don't, I'm not very optimist about uh, we are doing enough for foundation state at the center level in the near future. If the foundation is weak, if teaching learning is, you know, genuinely compromised, uh, what uh, Professor Sina was mentioning, the, you know, Professor Sina, I'm being told by one of my students who is in USA now, that there, the teaching learning process means 80% of the class time, students participate, 80%. Teachers speak for 20, 80%. And what they have done, they have really spent quite a good sum of money to conjure up a, uh, a very 3D kind of ambience within the classroom. They have spent heavily. They have got the money possibly, I, I know. So that you get a real time 3D, uh, very good feeling that you are part of the classroom, though you are attending online. Now, what would be the extent of blended mode? 
the online and the offline. It's, it's one way of saying a blended. But what is the composition of online and offline? That is also very important to see. But I believe that Vishwaguru, how do you measure our Vishwaguru ness and what are the indicators of that? And are we doing enough for the, because it's a pyramid, are we doing enough at the basic level? Then we can think about uh, being a part of uh, the global higher education and uh, announcing that, okay, is we are the Vishwaguru. Yes. Yeah, I, I think uh, all the panelists will be uh, on the same plane uh, on the question that you have put up. Uh, we all feel the same. Like being a wish for guru is uh, uh, more like a, a, a terminology which has been coined, uh, which looks uh, very fancy but uh, may not seem to be possible even in a distant future uh, for various reasons. Uh, I have already uh, said in my uh, closing remarks that the uh, budget or, uh, may look futuristic, may be called futuristic, but there are fundamental uh, issues and foundational uh, issues to which uh, Professor uh, Somin has already pointed out. Until and unless we are able to uh, bridge those gaps, uh, we cannot even think about being wish for gurus. Like simply uh, giving some financial incentives uh, in order to uh, e either uh, increase the inflow of foreign students or by uh, trying to uh, bring in uh, some, uh, uh, some kind of an internationalization by way of uh, uh, blended mode uh, programs, uh, uh, etc., uh, may not be enough uh, for India to be uh, matching with global standards to actually become a Vishwa Guru. Also, uh, it is important for us to uh, uh, identify our own strengths. Uh, to which uh, many a times uh, uh, various experts. Uh, refer to and even in the national education policy um, there is a, a reference uh, uh, made to the uh, local uh, knowledge the traditional knowledge base that that india uh, is very rich with uh, but uh, there is hardly any effort to uh, either uh, uh, develop uh, uh, to uh, build records to uh, digitize those resources if we are now wanting to enter into that area of reaching out to the uh, new uh, millennial uh, population. Uh, so uh, how is it that we uh, would be able to make our local richness um, uh, our own advantage, if at all we are targeting to uh, even compete at the global level? Uh, maybe some of the areas that uh, we kept in mind, but certainly the, the very concept and the idea of Vishpa Guru appears to be um, a very, very distinct one. Uh, thank you, Professor Sinha. Pratima, would you like to say something on Vishwa Guru and uh, Mamrit? No, I uh, don't have much knowledge about this, but what I know is that among the BRICS countries, India spends the lowest um, uh, in terms of uh, spending, I mean, education as percentage of GDP is lowest among the BRICS countries. These countries like South Africa, Brazil for long back, I mean, 2010, 12, they were spending more than 6% of GDP on education. And uh, obviously our foundation is weak, so it's very difficult, but the way the uh, policy, the education budget, everything is, I mean, the vision, everything is going the way. A set of children or student will just leave higher education because they won't be able to continue with the way the tuition fees and things are uh, increasing. And on the other hand, those that the very creamy layers will uh, go outside India to continue their study. So very few people will left. And I, I really don't know how this is possible, but yeah. Yeah. If, uh... I may be just uh, um, maybe allowed to put in just one line, you know, that's 
why are we really bothered about being a Vishwa Guru? I mean, <laughs> because everybody is a guru in their own right. I mean, <laughs> why do we want among hundred and so many countries, do we want to say that, you know, we will be your leader and we will be your guru, we will be teaching you everything? No, 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 that's not possible. I think, you know, the uh, if we want to be, first, we, we need to be cultured and civilized enough to accept the fact that, yes, there are, there, are, there are people who are as civil or maybe better civil than we are. I mean, that's what acceptance would perhaps create this basis for us to, in fact, improve our conditions. Because as long as we think that we are guru, and uh, then, you know, we do not really improve ourselves. You know, there, are, there is so much that we got to really uh, uh, look at and take care. Uh, I don't know. I mean, unfortunately, this Amrit Kal has begun in a kind of a situation when there is when there is when there's a serious crisis you know uh, we can't think of two years ahead or maybe five years ahead maybe people have vision i don't know what what to say about 25 years ahead india at 100 uh, at least i will not be there so why should i be dreaming about it uh, and uh, so uh, but the fact of the matter is that I think you know, we have great challenges in the area of education. I think we've got to be alive to those. Uh, we have uh, huge disparities. And, uh, and there are these issues will have to be addressed first before we really. And I think you know, all panelists have said that you know, the foundational aspect is very important. Uh, we may have the numbers because, you know, we are 1.35 billion people. So anything we, we do has uh, huge numbers. So we may be publishing so much, fourth in the world rank. You know, I heard this and I was feeling good about it. Uh, but then immediately I, it slumped down to the fact that, okay, you know, if we see it in per capita terms, we have potentials. I think every country has potential. But this potential will have to be cultivated. And this potential cannot be cultivated if we think that there are segment of people only who can perhaps have the capacity to think critically or can perhaps produce. And there are others who are going to be uh, the second class citizens, which I believe is the attitude which you know we got to fight. And as long as we have this attitude, we cannot become gurus because gurus have compassion. And uh, I think that's the first principle of through which you know one could start uh, um, uh, communicating in the process of education. Uh, so that's the fundamental aspect. If we are not compassionate, we can't be gurus at all. Uh, that's my understanding. We can have the best of the world institutions here, but we'll never have the compassion because this is this comes from a certain kind of a process which I believe is is situated not uh, in an atomized kind of an institutional framework, which in fact develops through greater interactions and through the sense of um, uh, equality. So that's what will make us gurus, if at all we become, but uh, we should be happy that we are one of them. I don't think it, we should be really <laughs> feeling sad that we have failed to become a guru. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, thank you, uh, everybody. I there's think a you question. Know, uh, okay, there is a question. I didn't see this. Yeah, there's a question from, uh, but from the that, chat. Should you on the chat box? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, where is the question? Uh, should you Prakash Upadhyay? I want to know how Bihar's higher education has been laid behind in this budget and how it can recover itself from graduate unemployment. Okay, it hasn't come on my chat. I don't know. No, why. no, you look at q and A. It's in q and A. But would anyone like to take that? That's a very different direction question. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was looking at the chat anyway. Yeah. See, the union budget uh, doesn't say much about Bihar higher education. Bihar, the, yeah. The Bihar, so the budget of the state, the government of Bihar that will be presented before the Bihar Vidhan. Uh, sometime in March, that we'll talk about. But graduate unemployment is a big issue for all of us today, not yeah. about Bihar. I mean, it's a big issue. And there are two reasons. One is that the kind of growth that we are experiencing, uh, we are not creating enough job opportunities. 
And secondly, very often we, the graduates, I'm including myself as a graduate, we, the graduates are being very often accused of not having the necessary skill to enter the job market. And these are very contestable issues. And uh, in fact, Professor Sina and Arjun and anybody can join and uh, end the discussion. That's all from my side. Uh, I can add just one point, maybe, um, I mean, not yeah, very yeah. direct, but there is the one scheme, Rashtriya Uchitar Siksha Abhijan, and the Department of Higher Education, which is more responsible towards, I mean, uh, in, uh, centers grant towards state colleges and universities for uh, better infrastructure and improvement. And if we look at the RUSA um, budget, uh, the allocation actually has decreased. Uh, it, it has uh, 3,000 crore, um, in last year's budget estimate, revised estimates only 793 crore. And this year, again, the allocation is 2,043 crore. That means from the previous year's budget estimate, the allocation is lesser and last year couldn't uh, allo uh, ex I mean, spend more. So since this uh, scheme is somehow uh, is responsible for improving the colleges and universities um, at the state level and uh, so it has some impact on Bihar's, uh, grad, I, mean, I mean, state run colleges uh, and universities. This is one of the points. And another thing is the scholarship for students of colleges and universities and the, uh, in the interest subsidy given to student loans. In both the cases, there is decrease. And so this will hamper the uh, students to join the, I mean, college or continue or complete the, uh, their graduation, it will affect. So might be that way Indian budget is actually affecting Bihar's, uh, I mean, graduate education and employment to some extent. Thank you. So, so uh, uh, yeah, yeah, please. So when we are talking about uh, graduate unemployment, uh, there are two aspects to it, certainly, uh, the uh, preparedness of our graduates for uh, the uh, new aged uh, skills that are in need, but also on the other and the availability of jobs. And we all know that India has been going through uh, extended period of jobless growth. And uh, even in this new budget, when we are, um, when we are, uh, expecting a more than 9% economic growth. And uh, there is an announcement of creation of 6,000 uh, more uh, jobs uh, in the country. 60 uh, lakhs. Yeah, 60 <laughs> lakhs, yeah, 600,000 uh, six, six, yeah. 600, uh, jobs yeah. in the country. So uh, that is something uh, which we still uh, wish to see. Uh, as a as a wishful uh, thinking, but even if we are able to create as many jobs, uh, we may not be able to uh, uh, fill the gap between uh, the demand and the uh, supply of jobs in the market. Uh, there are many more uh, graduate uh, you know, population, much more graduate population, which is in need of uh, uh, reasonably good quality uh, regular jobs. And uh, um, there is also now a greater emphasis on uh, uh, developing entrepreneurial skills and um, the and promoting the startup uh, community and ecosystem in the country. Uh, so maybe these are some new areas which uh, the higher education sector also needs to look at as to how to create job. Uh, creators rather than job seekers. And as Professor Chattopadhyay has already mentioned, that it is also uh, equally uh, important for the states to own this responsibility uh, rather than just looking at the center. Uh, so on that note, uh, thank you very much, Professor Sina. Thank you. Are there, I think, you know, Arjun, with your permission, you know, we should uh, conclude uh, the session. I think I will conclude by saying thanks to all of you because, you know, I have been making uh, comments in between also. Uh, so it was nice uh, uh, interacting with all of you. Uh, you know, just one thing, you know, that perhaps if, uh, if, since, you know, I have three people from uh, finance, so... 
I heard that, uh, I mean, there is a, what we call is a capital expenditure is going to be to the tune of two lakh crores and so on, something like that. And somebody deconstructed it and it really ma didn't make me very, very, uh, but then there is one part of it that the state governments do better in terms of uh, capital expenditure which will make available to them. So it will be faster. So I believe that, you know, once that happens, uh, maybe, you know, the situation in this uh, uh, expenditure, if at all, educational expenditure would look brighter. But I don't think it's going to happen in that direction. Uh, so thank you all and thank you very much. Thank you participants who have been thank here. You. And we have been here for nearly two hours plus. Thank you panelists for uh, a much longer than expected session. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank so you. Thank to you. officially just uh, one minute to uh, give the vote of thanks, now I invite uh, Shavya to formally give the vote of thanks. So, so capital expenditure also human capital. So would we discuss education today? Shavya. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. As we come to the end of this enriching and insightful deliberation on education and union budget 2022-23, I, Shravya Ignamurti, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally propose the vote of thanks. On behalf of the IMPRI Center for ICT for Development, I thank our distinguished panel for taking out the time to be with us today. We are grateful to Professor Sachidanand Sinha for chairing the discussion and driving it with his valuable inputs and intervention. Thank you, sir. We thank our panelists, Professor Mona Khare, Dr. Prativa Kundu, Professors Somain Chattopadhyay and Dr. Y. Suresh Reddy for sharing their pertinent analysis and perspectives on budget 2022-23. And we are also grateful to all the participants who joined us here today on Zoom and on Facebook Live or would be watching us later on YouTube or listening to our podcast. We hope that you continue to tune in to future episodes of Education Dialogue and our other web policy talks. Thank you again, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a good night. Thank you. Bye.